Dr. Batterin. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk to you about bariatric surgery, which is a treatment option for people who have tried lifestyle and still are severely obese. Bariatric surgery can cause marked sustained weight loss, and it can lead to marked improvement and remission of type 2 diabetes. Importantly, this occurs within days of surgery. Now, we know that the gastrointestinal tract produces a panoply of signals which regulate energy and glucose homeostasis. And actually working out how these surgeries interact with these signals to mediate the beneficial effect holds, I think, one of the greatest promises we have for being able to move forward in treating people with type 2 diabetes and obesity. Now, I want to start off by just giving you a bit of context. So this is the average patient who I see with severe obesity. This is John. He's 45 years old. He weighs 363 pounds. He has tried multiple interventions to try and lose weight. He has poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, despite being on multiple agents. He has high blood pressure, fatty liver, obstructive sleep apnea treated with CPAP, and not surprisingly, he has problems with mobility. Now, what does John's 10-year outlook look like? Well, actually, at the moment, it doesn't look great. He's at high risk of a major cardiovascular event, of developing the complications of type 2 diabetes, liver cirrhosis, cancer, and his life expectancy is likely to be reduced. Now, for people like John, at the moment, we know the only effective treatment we have is bariatric surgery. And what are the data for this? Well, we know that on average, people who undergo bariatric surgery lose 25% of their total body weight at five years. We also know that there is a marked improvement or resolution of the majority of the comorbidities that come with severe obesity. So if we look particular at type 2 diabetes, two years post-surgery, 60% of all patients will be euglycemic off all of their medication. Now, many of these patients go on to relapse, but they do this on a lower drug burden. There's also resolution of hypertension, sort of fatty liver and even NASH, and improvement of all the other conditions. From a patient perspective, there's a marked improvement in quality of life. Bariatric surgery also prevents new onset type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and strokes. And if you put all of that together, this translates into a 40% reduction in mortality. And for people with type 2 diabetes, if we look at their seven-year mortality, it's a 92% reduction. Well, what about the longer term? We're not talking about HbA1c, we're talking about the complications. And we now know that if we look at 10 years after bariatric surgery, there's a 30% decrease in the microvascular complications. And that's even in the folk whose their diabetes come back. So we're coming back to this legacy effect again. So for people who have remission of diabetes, but then it comes back, they still have a 30% decrease in their microvascular complications. Now, who's eligible at the moment by most criteria around the world for bariatric surgery? Well, in order to qualify, you have to have tried and failed or not been able to sustain meaningful weight loss with a lifestyle intervention. Now, I also want to stress that bariatric surgery on its own is not really going to work. It has to be embedded in the lifestyle intervention that you've heard Dr. Wang tell us about. But people with a BMI over 40 or a BMI over 35 with a comorbidity are eligible. Now, there has been a marked increase in the number of surgeries done globally, but this is still only 580,000 operations in 2014. So if we look in the US, that's less than 0.08% of people who would be eligible to undergo the surgery. Now, in case you're not really au fait with bariatric surgery, my slide, which is harder to use without a pointer, shows you the two commonest types. So in the top part of my slide is a Roux Y gastric bypass, and in the bottom part is a sleeve gastrectomy. Now, both of these procedures 
alter the routes that nutrients take through the gut. The gut being the greatest endocrine or the largest endocrine organ in the body. And by changing the flow of nutrients through the gut, we are changing the signals that come from the gut that regulate glucose and body weight. Now, with a bypass, food passes from the esophagus into a small gastric pouch, then directly into the jejunum, bypassing the majority of the stomach and the duodenum, if you're English, duodenum, if you're American. And for a sleeve gastrectomy, this simply re involves removing 80% of the stomach. Now, these procedures are not without risk or without cost. So there is really limited access to surgery globally. And the actual surgery itself comes with an initial cost outlay. There is also a risk, a risk of the surgery, varying between one in 500 to one in 1400, depending on the level of expertise in when the surgery is being undertaken. There's also a five to 10% risk of immediate complications to do with the surgery, and then later complications to do with nutritional deficiencies. And these patients have to sign up to lifelong follow-up, and they need to take multivitamins and nutrients along the way. But what about the individual? I'm going to show you John again. So this is John before surgery, and then two years after a gastric bypass. So he's lost 120 pounds. 32% of his body weight. He no longer has diabetes, it's in remission, but still under follow-up. His hypertension is resolved. He no longer needs his CPAP machine, and his life is looking much happier. However, there is a very variable response to bariatric surgery. We know this with lifestyle, we know it with drugs, so it shouldn't come as a great surprise that there's a variability in response to surgery. And about one in five people either don't do well initially or they regain the weight. And we know that 70% of this is heritable, which tells you there's a really important interplay between the biology of the gastrointestinal tract and the genetics. And what this does is it gives us what I would classify an experimental tool using the biology, the genetics, the omics, and the response to really interrogate our understanding of how the gastrointestinal tract is regulating body weight and glucose. So bariatric surgery, like every other mechanism that causes weight loss, does it primarily through reducing food intake. Patients say they don't feel hungry, so there's a marked decrease in appetite, which is the opposite to what we see with weight loss through dieting. Patients no longer are interested in food. If we undertake brain imaging studies and look at reward to food cue, then the actual activation in the reward regions of the brain changes after bariatric surgery. And again, this is a relatively quick effect. Taste changes. Patients no longer like sweet and fatty food because their taste preference changes. And these are some of the key factors that lead to a decrease in food intake. Well, what are the biological mediators? My slide here lists some of the current contenders. So changes in gut microbiota, changes in neural, neural signaling, changes in gut peptides and bile salts. But when we undertake bariatric surgery, there's a whole panoply of these things that act in concert. But what we need to do is try and work out which are the key. So at the moment, bariatric surgery for the group of people with severe obesity offers unparalleled health benefits. But more importantly, it probably actually holds the key to really understanding how we could treat type 2 diabetes or even put it into remission and also obesity. And what we really need to do is embrace both bariatric surgery, but make sure that we are studying these patients and getting the most out of it. Thank you very much.